Hello friends, I hope that you are having a wonderful day today. In today's video, we are going to be doing a story time for Luciana the Jumper's adventures over in the world of Chronicle, which has been fused with, in Luciana the Jumper's case, the generic Totally Not Mind Control Jump by Burkus. And this is going to be the second such story time video that we are doing for Luciana the Jumper. I hope that you enjoy what you are about to hear. Luciana the Jumper's time in the world of Chronicle and Generic Totally Not Mind Control will begin with the lad opening their eyes and finding themselves on a school bus. This will elicit a dry chuckle from the adventurer who has been, uh, who's been jumping for numerous decades at this point and has actually spent surprisingly little time in such a mundane setting. That said, when they open their eyes and find themselves on the school bus, they will immediately begin to utilize some of their new powers. They will curiously begin to attempt to use their telekinesis on light objects nearby, such as people's backpacks and even the various things that people have attached to themselves, such as earrings and watches. At first, it will take a little bit, but they will manage to detect when they have done, when they have strained themselves enough that if they move any further, or if they attempt to use their power anymore, they will cause a nosebleed, one of the most common side effects of this form of telekinesis. The school bus will only take a few minutes to arrive at the school that Luciano the Jumper is now attending, and when it does, they will begin to make use of their abilities, particularly their abilities to sense what sort of people are in need and what sort of help people need. They will go and register as a new student, doing all of the new student things, as well as seeing, for the first time, Andrew, Stephen, and Matt, the three protagonists of Chronicle, the film, and, at the same time, they will immediately sense the sort of danger and assistance that Andrew needs. During their first day, nothing particularly exciting will happen. Throughout the day, they will train telekinesis, grateful for the fact that they have a training booster that allows them to make incredible progress remarkably fast with this ability. They will be careful to use their power thoughtfully and do so in ways that they will not be noticed. They'll do subtle things, like when they're in gym class and they alter the direction and speed of a thrown object, making it so that someone is able to catch a pass or that someone is able to hit a baseball. At the same time, they will only do, they'll only use their ability just enough to train it ever so slightly and not enough to actually strain their body. This is a brand new power and they do not want to actually tip any, they do not want to alert anyone to the fact that they have it. Luciano the Jumper does not quite understand how it is that this power works they do remember what they read in the jump doc but that is the only sort of information that they have so they know enough to know that telekinesis in the setting is incredibly rare but they do not know enough to know if it's unique especially not in the way that luciano the jumper acquired it which is purely through fiat backing as opposed to having to go to the actual cave that the characters in the film will need to go to in a couple of days. Once the day is over, Luciano the Jumper immediately resolves to go ahead and not head straight home. They can remember all of the things that they purchased and all of the options that they made from the jump docks, and in fact, they've always been able to remember all of these things. So they know that when they go home, they're going to be in for a rough time that they just have to endure. Luciano the Jumper's first night is spent exploring the city of Seattle and tracking down criminal elements to interact with. Luciano the Jumper defeats more than one gang using their other abilities as well as subtle implementations of telekinesis. Their first full week of school is this way. Eventually, they will go home and go to bed and wake up and get ready for school, but it is always very late and they're always careful to be as sneaky and as quiet as possible. They do not want to interact with the people who live around them. 
Luciano the Jumper's nature as a drop-in does prevent them from having a direct family that they live with in this jump, but they very quickly realize that instead of having abusive parents, they have abusive neighbors who go out of their way to make Luciano's life certainly inconvenient, though it is not quite possible for them to actually be a danger to Luciano, even in Luciano's unusual state. Luciano is the sole owner of a small house not far outside of the city of Seattle, close enough that school buses are still able to go and pick them up and drop them off, and they quickly learn to adjust to this. Over the course of the first week, they get used to life, and they defeat numerous criminal elements in the city, while also making contact with the business that Luciano was able to acquire at the end of their time in, Gen uh, not at the end, but partway through the time that they spent in Generic Werewolf. One of the critical events which has begun to occur, which is already enacting subtle changes to the plot of Chronicle during this time, is that Luciano immediately befriends Andrew. There are numerous other students at the school who are in need of help, and Luciano does go out of their way to help them as well, but the number one person who is seemingly constantly in need of help is Andrew, and Luciano subtly uses powers like a helping hand and a passive renewal to go and heal and assist the lad, while also being careful to not reveal that they are the source of any of the unusual happenings which have been occurring in Andrew's life. For the better, thankfully, unlike many of the other times that I have done this particular jump, as I have a history of using this jump, and oftentimes the characters that I make who come here are not good lads. Um... <laughs> But Andrew is very quick to befriend the strange adventurer, and the two of them become close fast. This is because of the fact that Andrew is in need of assistance that Luciano is willing to provide, and also the fact that Luciano, over the course of the first week, reveals himself to be a kind and genuine and gentle listener who is able to talk to Andrew and is able to help Andrew overcome his problems very subtly. Good advice combined with the effects of some of Luciano's perks make it entirely possible for Andrew to begin to overcome some of the problems that Andrew has, although obviously the very worst ones are beyond Luciano's ability to directly help, at the very least, at this particular moment in time. A couple of days after the first week of school, the party in which Andrew, Stephen, and Matt get their powers occur, and Luciano is there as well. All four of the young adventurers and soon-to-be telekinetics and current telekinetic in Luciano's case are in the cave when the three lads who do not yet have their powers get their powers. All four of them admire and gawk at the crystal, with Luciano feigning ignorance as to at least some aspects of the true nature of the being that has perished. Because for those of you who do not know, especially in this drawback-filled version of Chronicle, what they find in the cave is not a crystal, but rather a living being that is a crystalline organism. So it's not that it's not a crystal, it's that it's a crystal and other things. And they get their powers. In Luciano's case, this does not cause a direct change, and Luciano is actually the figure who gets them out of the cave and uses a passive renewal, Luciano's passive healing perk, to ensure that the lads recover and are able to get home safely. Luciano does not quite explain what has just happened, although they do subtly implant the idea that something unnatural must have occurred, at the very least to Andrew, to go ahead and set future events in motion. It is at this time that Luciano considers beginning to teach the characters about their abilities, but they make the decision to allow events to play out organically. Over the course of the next two and a half weeks, the three lads independently realize that they have newfound and unnatural abilities, partially due to Luciano gently nudging them all in that direction, although Andrew is the first person to say something. 
uh, Luciano demonstrates their form of telekinesis, which is noticeably stronger than the others, but also manages to make it so that the others do not question this, and instead explains that Luciano has been training their ability not for longer, but more intensely than the others have, which the others eventually accept and decide to be inspired by rather than be suspicious of. There is no reason for them to be particularly suspicious of this, as Luciano does not demonstrate any super advanced abilities with this power, although at this point Luciano has already discovered that they can fly using telekinesis, especially using this form of telekinesis. Luciano also hints that there are a number of other applications, and they go ahead and show off the ability of telekinesis to do more impressive things than simply move objects. They actually manage to show them a force field, kind of, for the first time, directly nullifying numerous attempts by the lads to try and hit Luciano as a way of subtly flexing on them and inspiring them to learn defensive abilities, which are going to be incredibly handy. This is where the plot begins to enormously deviate. Because of Luciano's passive perks that make it so that their presence alleviates problems of their friends and so that they can help friends through their problems, they are able to completely subvert the worst elements of Andrew's life, and Luciano the Jumper continues to unify criminal elements to the point of eventually incorporating the lads into their particular operations. They don't ever do anything as direct or as blunt as having the lads go on adventures with them, but they do go out of their way to hint that they are responsible for numerous different news articles, including a strange but thankful and positive decrease in crime rates throughout Seattle. Andrew's father stops being an abusive asshole over the course of the time that Luciano is in Andrew's life, almost completely. While he is still a drunk who on occasion will verbally abuse his son and his wife, he never actually hits them anymore. And this is something that Andrew notices, but he's not sure what is the cause, because it is not direct intervention on Luciano's part that causes this. At least not the direct at least not what people envision when they hear the term direct intervention. It is Luciano's perks that have passively caused this to occur. And Andrew is grateful for it nonetheless. And at the same time, Andrew has begun to become genuinely more popular among his schoolmates due to guidance from Stephen, Matt, and Luciano. And Luciano himself has begun to become quite popular as well. All four of the lads are very distinctive, well-known members of the community by the time the talent show rolls around. In the immediate aftermath of the rather spectacular talent show, which in this version of Chronicle is still only done by Stephen and Andrew rather than including Matt or Luciano, the, the events of the movie have been, by and large, completely subverted. And nothing particularly bad happens for the rest of the school year. Andrew and Stephen do not have a fight that causes Stephen to die. Andrew is not killed at the end of the events of the movie partway through the school year. Matt never has to flee by himself. The entire world of Chronicle is subtly changed by this. And Luciano the Jumper almost begins to forget that there is a cataclysmic showdown on the horizon. When all four of the figures graduate, Luciano offers to pay for Andrew to go to college, and Andrew actually takes up Luciano on this offer. Nonetheless, this causes, this causes Andrew to become the only figure to begin to learn some of the true extent of Luciano's resources, as Luciano does, at this point, explain that they are the head of an organization that earns hundreds of thousands of dollars 
in numerous countries, amounting to a total of at least a couple million dollars a year all over the world. Luciano never fully explains this, and Luciano is willing to allow it to seem strange that a teenager owns such a prolific business, especially a teenager who did go to school and who also did crime fighting and a number of other things, such as telekinesis training, and Andrew does not ever fully question it, instead being so grateful to Luciano's friendship to that they opt to simply trust that Luciano is a benevolent figure. And to Luciano's credit, they are, so this is a good decision. Luciano at this point has already resolved that if anyone ever truly questions, at least any of the core three lads ever fully question Luciano, they will provide more or less honest answers. They probably wouldn't go out of their way to explain the concept of the multiverse and jump chains, but they would still go out of their way to explain, um, to some extent, just how odd all of this is. At this point, years begin to pass. And during this time, Luciano is still powerfully active in Seattle's underworld. Luciano does not actually leave Seattle, at least not for any long period of time. No more than a week and a half will pass with Luciano outside of Seattle for the first five years of their time in Chronicle. But when the five-year mark rolls around to the day, something new happens. The Mogu, from the drawback, emerges from hiding and goes on a rampage. The second Luciano begins to read tweets about something occurring in the Honduran city of San Pedro Sula, they react and they utilize their full super speed, super speed fast enough to allow Luciano to run on water and to move at speeds eclipsing some jets to go from Seattle to San Pedro Sula. No hesitation is made. There is never any fear in Luciano's mind, as Luciano has been preparing for this. Throughout all of this time, they have been carefully honing their abilities, and they've even been practicing some of their powers, like state refresh and full immunity, and honing them so that way to the point where they no longer need to touch someone to confer the effects of State Refresh, which is an anti-mind control perk from generic Totally Not Mind Control. This is a significant ability, because Luciano remembers that the Mogu has the ability to trap people into a hive mind in exchange for granting them telekinesis. Luciano, at this point, has not yet encountered a living Mogu. They're not sure if there's only one other left, or if there is some other explanation. Perhaps they live so far underground that encountering them, unless they're, in a free, unless they're in a feeding season, is simply not a thing that occurs. But either way, they are very careful, and they go on the attack. When they reach the city of San Pedro Sula, they see flying humans who are hurling objects around and who are capturing people to toss into a large hole. Luciano correctly assumes that the large hole is the location of the Mogu, but does not attempt to immediately deal with the Mogu, instead focusing on beginning to undo the damages that have been caused by its drones, as well as freeing the drones from mind control. Luciano will shift into their werewolf form and will use the enhanced agility and speed as well as their telekinesis to get close to the hundreds of drones and free them using state refresh. This will of course surprise the drones who will then begin to fall out of the sky especially since they've been liberated from the hive mind and they feel the full negative effects of their form of telekinesis but Luciano is still able to rapidly save and heal each of them before turning their attention to the actual rampaging monster that is currently attacking the city. Luciano will dive into the hole and will confront the massive crystalline beast inside of it, alone and unafraid. 
they're able to use their super speed as well as their very powerful form of telekinesis at this point to repel numerous attacks ranging from hurled rock walls to all sorts of objects to the point of even including magma being tossed at Luciano from deep underground. Thankfully, Luciano's telekinesis and speed are more than enough to meet this challenge, and the Mogu very quickly begins to realize that it is facing an incredibly dangerous foe, someone who's capable of doing something that it has never seen before, using telekinesis while being a human, and also not being under the control of any other Mogu. The creature does eventually retreat, and when it does, Luciano attempts to follow it before realizing that the creature is too fast and its telekinesis is too strong. The deeper underground it goes, the more dangerous things it can hurl at Luciano, and the bigger a risk it becomes of causing other effects in other regions. So Luciano decides that for now, the best move is to let the object and let the beast leave. Luciano is, of course, disappointed by this, but Luciano wants to begin to heal people and help people before doing anything else. When Luciano arrives back at the surface of the world, Luciano is questioned by numerous Honduran government officials and spends truly entire days having to explain some of what happened. Luciano is, thankfully, persuasive enough that they are able to convince people that it is for the best that the people who were freed are able to live normal lives under the help of Luciano's organization, which at this point has already begun to prepare for the eventuality of the Mogu attack and enacted numerous nonprofits, including several that were stationed in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, and the Middle East, and the United States, as well as Europe. So that way, if anywhere the creature attacked, there would be people on Luciano's side who could do things. Luciano's government official allies, some of which were already contacted by the nonprofits that Luciano set up, are able to be convinced fairly easily, especially once Luciano reveals their true identity and explains that they are one of the benefactors who have been helping people and have been doing emergency preparedness and first responses all over the world. People are not exactly thrilled at the idea of losing Luciano's support, so they do decide to contact a bare minimum of people internationally, including some people in the United States government, and explain what all happened, as well as show off some of the telekinetic abilities as a means to persuade people to do as Luciano says. Luciano is not here strong-arming people, but rather using genuine persuasiveness, as well as relying on some of their perks, um, including and especially secrecy insurance, to make sure that a masquerade is erected. But Luciano also warns that there may well come a day when the masquerade falls. And this day will not occur for another couple of years. The masquerade that Luciano erected manages to last a surprisingly long amount of time, but this is mostly due to the Mogu's relative inactivity. When a Mogu feeds successfully, even only partially successfully, it is able to hibernate for a long period of time. However, Luciano's intervention was so fast that the Mogu was only fed a bare minimum amount needed to enter into a hibernative state for a couple of years. Around the 7.5 year mark into Luciano's time in Chronicle, the creature re-emerges, this time in a small town in the Midwestern United States. And the second that it emerges, it begins to move, which is a new tactic. And this is part of the reason why when the creature hits a city in Texas, the masquerade is no longer able to be kept up. At this point, the creature has already given hundreds of people telekinesis, as well as fed numerous times. Because it was a small town, no one was able to react fast enough that Luciano was able to notice what was going on. 
So it is only when the creature emerges in a city in Texas that more and more people notice and more and more people freak out and Luciano is able to see on the internet what is occurring. At this point, Luciano is already back in Seattle and is able to reach Texas noticeably faster because at this point they have continued to train and hone their superpowers, including their super speed, which is now uncapped due to some of the perks that Luciano has from this very jump. So they are faster than they've ever been, and they're able to reach Texas within a handful of minutes, less than five, from Seattle, which is a testament to how incredibly fast they have become. They are able to intervene almost immediately, and they do engage in battle with the creature one more time. But once again, they do have to help free and save people while also nullifying some of the creature's more aggressive abilities. More and more people at this point have gotten telekinesis than got telekinesis during the Battle of San Pedro Sula. And when Luciano successfully manages to repel the creature once more, the creature has both fed more and has also transformed more people into its drones. This is the tragedy that causes Luciano to help organize a press conference and to help reveal the existence of telekinetics to the world. At the very end of the first movie in what was supposed to have been a series of movies, telekinesis is revealed to the world, and it is revealed formally at the uh, partway through the second movie, and this time, numerous years have passed, and several dozen, and now several hundred people, have telekinesis. Luciano recognizes the importance of the masquerade, but also recognizes that it cannot be maintained any longer. Luciano is instead one of the first people to help explain the existence of Mogus, and they use footage, revealing that the footage, which not always the highest quality footage, is real, showing some of the creature's long, almost eldritch tendrils and the maw of the beast, as well as showing off people flying and using telekinesis. Luciano explains the concept of the hive mind, which at this point is something they have become cognizant of through interviews with victims of the Mogu, as well as several other abilities that Luciano possesses that allow them to dive into the minds of people, most particularly telepathy, which is strong enough in Luciano's case to allow them to see some outer vestige, some outer shell of the hive mind without directly interfacing with it, which Luciano has very wisely decided not to do. So Luciano explains that their abilities are real, that they are a true sort of superhero and apologizes for the masquerade, but explains that they wanted time to prepare the world. Unfortunately, now is the time for the world to begin preparations in full. There are supernatural creatures in the world, at least one, and that supernatural creature is capable of conferring supernatural abilities to other creatures, but at a truly great cost. The world listens, and while there are skeptics and naysayers who attempt to explain away what has happened, numerous people in positions of power, several of whom have been directly benefited from Luciano's organization, decide to take Luciano's words seriously and prepare themselves. They reinforce areas underneath cities, and areas underneath towns also get renovations and are transformed into areas that people can explore and can use in various ways, in part with the help of Luciano's telekinetic forces. And at this point, Luciano has also begun and is beginning to explore sharing powers with their allies. Tragically, the final confrontation which, occur, which will occur in about another two and a half years, occurs in Seattle itself. Luciano's kind of home city, at the very least in the context of this jump. Before that occurs, Luciano's forces expand tremendously. The organization, as well as Luciano's governmental, intergovernmental, and non-governmental allies, including criminal organizations, begin to make preparations for what they know is coming, another Mogu attack. 
they all know the very real threat that is coming. Some of them, especially some of Luciano's closer allies, are survivors and victims of the attacks itself. At this point, only two have occurred, but that is still enough to have left hundreds of thousands of people affected by it. Both San Pedro Sula and the city of, let's say, Dallas, have millions of people living in them. And they are cities that are modern, that are connected to the rest of the countries that they are a part of. And when the finale finally comes, they will have been cities that will have been altered forever by the Mogus. Luciano is also sharing their abilities with people all over the world in some cases, sharing passive abilities and making it so that people can learn how to defend themselves just in case they need to protect themselves from a Mogu attack, because Luciano does not actually know where the Mogu will emerge. Luciano is thankfully rather close by when the finale begins to occur, and they're able to respond to it fast enough that they scare the Mogu itself because the actual location of the final battle is the same location in downtown Seattle where Andrew is supposed to have perished, according to the original canon of the Chronicle film. When Luciano appears on the scene, they immediately assault the creature, hurling vehicles and other sorts of large objects at it making it and hitting it so fast that it is not able to transform any more than a handful of people into telekinetics. Luciano is able to immediately free those people before they can even fly and actually evacuates them as their telekinesis is too weak for them to be helpful in the course of this battle. Uh, if you just saw that flash, I was checking the battery on my computer, and that was a smart call. Um... <laughs> When the final, when the finale begins in full, Luciano is quickly joined by Andrew, Stephen, and Matt, all of whom have returned to Seattle, partially at Luciano's request and also partially to help people. They have not revealed that they are telekinetics. They have kept that secret under wraps at this point, and they have not been involved in any of the previous conflicts because they lacked Luciano's super speed. They did not have the same ability that Luciano has to be able to respond incredibly quickly to conflicts all over the world as they are occurring. And they also lack Luciano's sense of wonderlust, effectively, which is what propels Luciano to be one of the first responders in all sorts of situations. At this point, Luciano has actually appeared all over the world using their super speed and has encountered people from all sorts of different cultures and helped in a range of both mundane and supernatural crises. So, when all four of them are unified along with a force of other telekinetics, they are able to pursue the Mogu, and this time they go directly after the beast, because they have come here fast enough and prevented enough damage from occurring that it is worth intervening. The Mogu is also being challenged by the fact that the area directly underneath Seattle has been reinforced, and it is not quite so easy for the beast to be a uh, little shit in. So, because of this, the creature has facing numerous disadvantages, not the least of which is the fact that this is the first time that it's facing multiple enemy telekinetics, as opposed to just one, even if the one that it is facing is pretty inarguably the single greatest telekinetic in the world. When the beast launches bursts of telekinetic energy at its foes, Luciano easily redirects them or otherwise completely nullifies them and makes it so that they inflict no damage on Luciano and Luciano's allies, all while all three of the main lads hurl objects as large as buses and as large as telephone poles at it, each of which does do little bits of damage. Without the telekinetic drones under the control of the hive mind, it is not able to fully and effectively uh, defend itself and attack at the same time, as it is only one creature. Even Luciano does not have the sort of potent perks that would be needed to be able to think more than one sort of mind stream at a time, which would be incredibly helpful 
in the case of using an ability like telekinesis. So Luciano would normally be at a pretty significant disadvantage because the Mogu is a creature that is entire kilometers long and it is a telekinetic. So it could simply use its limbs in addition to its telekinesis. But with the help of the other characters, it, it Luciano has the numbers advantage. Even with a barrage of tendrils that are several meters long and several meters thick in every single case, they are not able to connect with the telekinetics who are following the Mogu. The Mogu is followed deep underground when it eventually manages to get out of the subtle sort of trap that is the area directly underneath Seattle, but it is still being pursued. And... As more and more time passes, more and more telekinetics begin to show up. Luciano sends out a powerful tele telepathic signal to their allies every moment of the fight, conveying every part of it by focusing and projecting those images into everyone's minds. The creature attempts to flee, but it's simply unable to. At some points, after being damaged numerous times, the creature decides that its best move is simply to turn and face its enemies. This is, objectively, a mistake. Luciano and Luciano's allies are able to continue to whittle away at its HP, and even though the creature is stronger than they are in every respect, and primordial in its age and in its experience, it is not enough to overcome the numbers advantage, plus the advantages that Luciano has by their very nature of being a jumper. The sorts of wacky experience that Luciano has had fighting all sorts of creatures, including on more than one occasion a giant monster. They are able to hurl the beast out of the, out of the underground area once it gets sufficiently weakened, and they send its body together out near the sea. The creature thinks that they've made a mistake before Luciano reappears outside of Seattle and on a nearby coast. This is due in part to numerous changes which have occurred in the area, which allow Luciano to take on their ultimate battle form, the form of perfect chaos. This is one of Luciano's older abilities at this point, and it's not something that Luciano really uses enough. But the beast is still so strong that they are not able to fully damage it with simple bursts of telekinetic energy, even while hurling objects as large as telephone poles at it. So the creature has been whittled down, but is still very much alive. Luciano recognizes the need to change that, and keeps the beast's attention on them when they transform into perfect chaos before using their perfect chaos abilities to finally deal the beast lasting damage and eventually kill the creature. During all of this time, any individuals who get temporarily transformed into telekinetic drones are immediately saved by some of the backup that Luciano has stationed throughout Seattle. And when the finale finally comes, the creature lies dead. And the world is kind of saved. Now that the world has been saved, Luciano gets to spend the next couple of days dealing with the aftermath of the Mogu's demise, helping restore the parts of Seattle that have been damaged using, at this point, telekinesis that is strong enough to easily damage entire high-rises and entire apartment complexes, as opposed to singular buildings, to rebuild the devastated parts of the city, including and especially downtown Seattle, as well as to help make sure that the people who have re recovered from the attacks and those who survived, whether they were changed or not, have the medical care that they need. At this point, Luciano's own forces, particularly their organization, have gained numerous bits of experience when it comes to dealing with all sorts of supernatural crises, because Luciano used those forces to great effect during their time in the world of generic werewolf as well as here dealing with the aftermath of mogu attacks 
So all of Luciano's main force leaders are people who Luciano has been working with and who've been trained in how to deal with the supernatural, even though none of these figures were in the world of generic werewolf with Luciano, because that is not how I am doing followers and companions unless it would be stated otherwise as in the only way that i would do that followers are consistent people who follow you rather than just new people who show up who are working for you in some capacity is if the thing that i am using this from says that that is the case and that is not the case with the organization the generic werewolf the organization itself follows you but that does not mean that anyone who is in the organization in one jump is going to be a one-to-one -one copy who has all of their memories from the last jump that's just not how i'm running things but still luciano has gained all sorts of experience coordinating first response teams and doing all sorts of important humanitarian aid at this point and luciano's followers are all too happy to help effectively rebuild Seattle under Luciano's watchful eye and powerful telekinetic and telepathic coordination. It is worth noting that at this point Luciano has honed all of their abilities to new degrees and numerous powers of theirs are far more pronounced than they were before. Luciano has even gained experience converting a very tiny handful of people into werewolves and doing all sorts of other supernatural things using their abilities old and new alike. Because of this, when the time comes for Luciano to go to their next jump, they are all too happy to spend their final day on the beach once more and to watch the waves until their world blurs and they find themselves in their personal reality once again. This is one of the first times that Luciano is going to be honestly quite sad about a jump ending, because up until now, jumps have only been isolated adventures, but this jump really meant something. Luciano experienced new things for the first time in this jump. This jump marked the first time that they were in high school in a jump, and even though they hated that shit, they were still really nice. Uh, they were still really happy to get that experience and to be with friends, to make close comrades whose relationship with them persisted across the totality of a chain, to have trained people in using supernatural abilities, and to have helped save and change more than one or more than a handful of lives. It is really remarkable how much experience Luciano has gotten in this one jump after decades of jumping, since this was the first time that they were a proactive, heroic, um, like, sort of setting-changing presence. They engaged with politicians and business leaders. They were active in boardrooms and in criminal organizations, dismantling them from the inside and transforming those inside of them into heroes when possible, and otherwise making it so that the criminal organizations such as gangs and cartels could not hurt anyone. This was a game-changing setting for Luciano, not only because of the perks that they've gained, but also because of the experience that they've gained in being a proactive, heroic presence who works to inspire people. So when their benefactor's avatar shows up and explains to them that they had another great time watching Luciano's adventures, Luciano is kind of delighted but is mostly indifferent to that because to them all of this is just a tv show it's just a it's just a keeping up with the kardashians or that kind of show which is ostensibly based on true events and in someone's real life but there's always the possibility that it's not However, for Luciano, this is Luciano's real life. This is something that Luciano is doing where they are changing settings and changing people's lives for the better, helping people that they know and in their perspective are real living people who are every bit as alive as Luciano or anyone else from Luciano's native reality would be. So when they hear about the fact that the ratings are going great and that the audiences are delighted to see a more proactive and heroic Luciano who is 
actively doing things and is transforming settings of their own volition, they are delighted and they encourage Luciano to keep up the really good work. And then Luciano goes and does what they always do at the end of their jumps. They go and select their next setting. Onward to the next adventure, baby. I hope that you all have enjoyed this story. It's worth noting that this is actually a um, refilming of this particular video. I did another version of this where I focused on other things and I forgot to talk about the masquerade falling, which is actually pretty significant. As you can see, the masquerade falling was a central element to the story. The world learning that there are in fact supernatural beings of some sort and that there are people with objective superpowers who exist is a significant moment in the story of this particular setting. It is not the most important thing ever, but it's definitely something that affected how the final battle went. Luciano's ability to deal with the Mogu directly, and also everything from the presence of other telekinetics to um, the ability to slow down the Mogu, which is a telekinetic creature, which should ostensibly be able to effectively burrow through the earth at any speed that it damn well pleases, all of that was due to the fact that Luciano was able to directly leverage their influence and power, and they used that influence and power to shape how it was that governments did things, and also to do things of their own accord to make it more easy for the final confrontation to happen. All sorts of cities throughout the planet underwent the same sort of subtle renovations that Seattle underwent, so it didn't really matter where the final confrontation took place. I just thought that it would have been nice to honor the original ending of Chronicle by having the actual final battle take place in the same place. Um, just thought that was like a fun little uh, full cycle kind of thing. And... Um, Hope that you guys are having a wonderful day. I hope that you enjoyed the story. I am obviously going to be working on improving my storytelling over the course of these videos because I think that YouTube is a really fun way to tell stories and I've actually always wanted to tell stories on YouTube and I actually have told stories on YouTube before. Um, some of the older videos on my channel include a series called Mythology Mondays which I really like and I might someday try to get back to if I ever get to hit the point where I'm actually making a full-time living off of YouTube and can afford to release all sorts of things in a single day um, because I'm getting paid to do so. But yeah, if you all are enjoying the story, if you all are enjoying the story time videos, I hope that you let me know. I always have such fun filming these. Um, I know that they are longer, but I feel like their very format allows them to be longer, and it makes it possible for me to try and make my other videos be somewhat shorter. That said, um, this was a very fun video to film, and I cannot wait to see all of you again. Bye-bye, everyone.